but uh, it's certainly is a, a, a very special occasion for us to host Bill McComas on his Fulbright uh, placement here. He's a Parks Family Professor of Science Education from the University of Arkansas. He's been here since January and he'll stay till sometime in June. I think negotiable dates yet. No, it's done now. <laughs> June 18th. I have to start paying rent on the 19th, so. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, Bill has agreed to give a seminar and uh, Bill's as plus placement here. I have to want to acknowledge the Office of the Vice President of Research in partially in half funding his position here and the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Health in funding the other half and uh, Castell for hosting him and the School of Physical Science for housing him. Um, so, and he's been integrated across the faculty in Castell um, and across St. Pat's College in Condra, which uh, Castell is, embraces across the two campuses. Um, Bill's joined today by his wife Kim, who's a maths education professor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Kim leaves tomorrow. Uh, so Bill will be here on his own for the next couple of weeks and we'll get lots of work out of then. But uh, we'd like to just acknowledge Kim's uh, contribution while she's been here as well and uh, invite Bill to take the floor. Very good. Well, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, thanks very much for coming. As I've said to my, my DCU students who are assembled at the back, I, I, I'm amazed that there's still something I haven't shared with you because we've had hours and hours of conversation about all kinds of things. But we haven't had a whole lot of chance to talk about uh, the laboratory as a place of instruction. And that's actually was my entree into science education uh, because it was my dissertation topic. I explored the, the, the basic notion of exemplary laboratory practice. And it turns out, of course, not surprisingly, that exemplary laboratory practice and inquiry go hand in hand. Because even before this great push that we teach in an inquiry-oriented fashion, the best lab practitioners for you know, the past century in science instruction have been encouraging students to think on their own in ways that would be very similar to inquiry. So putting these two topics together, I will uh, uh, perhaps in inform and maybe even entertain you for the next little while. So uh, let's see where we are. Um, of course, I always like to march the hog out. My students have seen the hog come flying across the screen many times, the symbol of the great University of, of Arkansas. Uh, also, others of you who have heard my talks uh, in the past few months will recognize that I always like to point out where Arkansas is, but that's because most Americans don't know. And I recognize there may be no other Americans in the group beyond my wife who probably knows where Arkansas is, but uh, it's there in the middle. It's one of those purple things. And my uh, friends in California when I left there said, oh, that's a flyover state. Well, that's too bad for them because it's a really nice place to live. Uh, Fayetteville, the, uh, uh, the town where the flagship university is housed, is in the upper uh, northwest corner of the fine state of Arkansas. We're very close to, to Oklahoma. We're very close to Missouri. And Kansas doesn't quite touch us, but it's up there to the northwest. <clears throat> and I, I've shown this picture a number of times uh, for a couple of reasons. This is the newly restored uh, School of Education building. Uh, my office is right there. And that building was a lab school 100 years ago. And in fact, one of the young men who went to that lab school was J. William Fulbright, who was born and raised in Fayetteville, Arkansas. This is his statue. Uh, the College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences has been named after him. You know, he is certainly one of the mo most illustrious uh, Arkansans ever. And obviously, it would have been hard for the university to refuse my leaving on a Fulbright fellowship, given the connection with the state of Arkansas. So I brought that to the attention of the dean immediately. Uh, we also have, a, we have another interesting tradition on campus. It's perhaps the only university in the world that does this. Everyone who graduates has their name carved in concrete. Uh, they have a plan for the next uh, 10 or 15 years, and at which point they're just going to have to put in sidewalks that go nowhere. But they have promised that everybody who graduates from the University of Arkansas will have their name carved in the in the concrete. And I'm very proud to say that my wife just graduated uh, with her PhD in maths education, so her name will soon be carved somewhere on campus. Uh, and my son is now a first year student at the university, and in a few years he too, we hope, will graduate and have his name there in the concrete. I don't care that my name is not in the concrete because mine is on a paycheck every month. That's the key. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about inquiry instruction, and we'll talk a little bit about laboratory instruction, and you'll see how the two things flow together. Um, I, 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 only, I do say, ideally, inquiry instruction is a teaching technique through, that, that students, through which students will investigate a problem of their own interest and carry out some sort of investigation. That's ideal. 
that's very, very difficult to do. I, I can be an idealistic um, ivory tower kind of guy, but I'm also fairly pragmatic. I know that there's a curriculum. I know that they're leaving certain tests. I know that there are all sorts of things that teachers have to attend to, but there are possibilities for inquiry, even if not at the highest level, at some other level in science instruction, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, in reality, of course, inquiry has lots of different forms. Uh, there are things that are uh, high level of inquiry, low level of inquiry, and I would even argue that there are things that teachers do that they think might be inquiry that aren't inquiry at all. We'll get to that. Uh, inquiry does permit science instruction to resemble science itself in some ways. It's very, very difficult to simulate the doing of science in a school setting for one reason, if, if not all others. This Scientists have a lifetime of experience and context that they bring to problem solving. Kids don't yet. Some of the kids that we teach in schools now will become scientists and they will have that experience. They will have that context. They'll be able to, to draw upon that storehouse of prior experiences. But to ask, uh, to ask a school kid to act like a scientist is possible only up to a certain level because they simply will not have had those prior experiences. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it, we, should, we shouldn't expect kids to act like scientists in all ways, shapes, and forms before they've had an opportunity to, to really fully embrace what science means and the doing of science. Uh, inquiry is very learner-centered. It can be used to differentiate instruction. This is something that's very, uh, very problematic in school settings where you have a range of abilities among kids in a classroom. Um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about gifted kids and how we might cater to them. Uh, one of the things that one can do in a science classroom is to raise the level of inquiry for some kids in the class and perhaps not for other kids in the class. So it is, it's not an easy way to differentiate, but it certainly is a way to, to differentiate. Michelle, get offline there, will you, man? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had turned that off, actually. Yeah, sorry. Uh, anyway. The National, Science, uh, the National Science Education Standards uh, in the U.S. are an attempt to link the, the 50 states together around a science curriculum issue, around science curriculum issues. But what you should know is that in the U.S., education is a state's rights issue. Therefore, the federal government and any document that would say the national document about anything is, is, an, is a suggestion only. There is no reason that any state would have to follow this, these guidelines. But more than likely, they, they do. And that's so, you know, we can talk about a kind of national scene for science teaching in the US, even though if you really want to get right down to it, you have to look state by state. But one of the things in the current version of the National Science Education Standards is this quest for inquiry. And this document defines inquiry in two different ways. In other words, we would like students to have sort of two different inquiry experiences, perhaps interchangeably, but we, we would like them to have these two experiences, and here they are. It's important that students understand how scientists do their work. Even if students don't engage in inquiry themselves, it's very important that students understand, oh, that's, that's what scientists do. They inquire of nature and they they sort of tease out, they tease nature in a sense too, to try to, to try to unlock some of the secrets there. That would clearly be a passive view of understanding inquiry. Okay, I get it, this is what scientists do. I'm not a scientist, I've never done this myself, but I understand that this is what scientists do. So you could imagine what number two must be then. Let's give kids an, an opportunity then to engage in inquiry. Let's have kids do some of the things that scientists themselves do. So any, you know, I, I, one of the things that's very impressive among many uh, at, at Castell is this focus on inquiry. And I would hope that folks wouldn't be too dis, you know, disheartened if teachers don't fully embrace the, the engaging in inquiry as long as teachers communicate to students at least that this is what scientists do when scientists are doing, you know, their sciencey things. And it's a, sort of an inelegant way of saying that there are really two, two sides to the coin. Students really have to have an opportunity to practice inquiry if they're fully to understand how it works. And you know, that's where, as we would say in the States, the rubber hits the road. That's, that's the hard thing to do. 
especially when you're trying to track kids through a curriculum and, and pop them out the other end with a certain body of knowledge that may or may not be tested on an end of course exam, as we call them in the States. And of course, I now have come to loathe and love the, the leaving cert challenge that uh, Irish teachers face. Uh, inquiry has been around for a long time, but it got its present name with a slightly different spelling with Joseph Schwab back in the, uh, in the 1960s. He's kind of one of the founding fathers of modern science education. He wrote a lovely little book, um, this, this book pushing this quest for inquiry, as he called it, rather than inquiry. That spelling has sort of gone by the wayside. But for people who were doing literature searches, you want to search both words just to make sure that you recognize that there was an earlier spelling there, an earlier uh, way of thinking about it. And he had a lovely turn of phrase that I always like to share with people. He called science instruction a rhetoric of conclusions. That what students were getting when they were sitting in a science classroom, even a great, even you know, helped by a great science teacher, is they were hearing about things that were already done, rather than hearing about things that were happening. It was a done deal. And some kids could logically think, well, what's in it for me? Why would I be a scientist? It's already done. There's the, you know, if you look at a 1930 biology book or chemistry book and a physics book, and you look at a, you know, 2012 biology book, chemistry book, or physics book, you know, they're mammoth now compared to what they were. We must know everything there is to know about those fields. Certainly that's not true, but you can imagine the kids might think that. A colleague of mine, Richard Duschel, uh, has sort of shortened this a little bit, and he calls uh, school science final form science. It's in the textbook. We ship it out to kids, and they memorize it, and there you have it. There's no inquiry in either the rhetoric of conclusions or in final form science. I will add to this my own little turn of phrase. I think inquiry poses questions rather than imposing answers. Typical science instruction imposes answers on kids, and there needs to be some of that. But inquiry gives people an opportunity to think out of the box, to think for themselves, to ask their own questions, and to use the ways and means of science to get answers. <clears throat> well, here's a definition of laboratory instruction. You know, you really have to, you have to define your terms to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So I've done a little bit of definition of inquiry. Here's a definition of lab instruction. Any environment where students engaged in planned learning experiences and interact with materials to observe phenomena. There. It doesn't say, and I love this about this particular definition, it doesn't say that this has to happen in a lab room. And it doesn't say that it has to happen you know, during third period. It doesn't, you know, the, the inquiry and laboratory can, can occur in all sorts of different ways and means and places. I will get to that point too. A brand new report from the uh, US National Research Council uh, called America's Lab Report, which is quite good if you're not familiar with this document, it's uh, downloadable as a PDF, defines laboratory experiences as opportunities for students to interact directly with the material world or with data from the world using tools, data collection techniques, models, and theories of science. So really what this says is we need kids to be acting like scientists as much as they can. President of Harvard, Charles Eliot, who had a lot to say about a lot of things, including science instruction, back in the late 1800s said this, and it's, a, it's one of the best rationales for why we have a practical piece in science instruction, why we have laboratory instruction at all. He says there's very little profit in studying natural science in a book. Yay. For if, as if it were grammar or history. For nothing of the peculiar discipline which the proper study of science supplies can be obtained in that way. That's probably pretty dramatic. I think you probably can learn some things from books. But he was, you know, a hundred years ago, was advocating laboratory and inquiry teaching. A very quick romp through what a literature review would tell you about why we do laboratories. To encourage active involvement, to provide experience in problem solving and higher order thinking skills, to establish a bridge from concrete to abstract thinking. I won't read all of these. Interest, curiosity, doing of science, it's, you know, the kinds of things that most good science teachers would say to their headmaster or principal, but we've got to do laboratory, and here's why. This is only half the list, here are more things. Science, learning science process skills, developing an understanding of the nature of science. Now, you can actually learn the wrong things in the hands of the wrong teachers and laboratories. So I'm not suggesting that the mere act of having kids work through stuff in a, in a lab setting is guaranteed to be wonderful. 
it could actually be problematic. This is why we need well-educated teachers. Provide experience in using equipment, and of course, giving people some, some nature of, of how uh, science works. <clears throat> I mentioned that this interest of mine started when I was working on my dissertation. And I spent a lot of time in a lot of classrooms all over, uh, mostly in Iowa, but a few outside the state of Iowa. I'm a graduate of the University of Iowa. Uh, and I got lots and lots of neat quotes. And just the other day, Ailish and some colleagues and I were talking about, you know, what's the, you know, what do you do when you capture interview data? Well, one of the things you do is you capture all kinds of cool quotes. And they can be all, almost more interesting than you know, the kind of columns of numbers that you know, we, are easier to analyze. So here's a Wisconsin science teacher. When I asked him, well, why do you do labs? And he said, oh, experiencing science is critical because it teaches students about the joys and frustrations of science, the elegance of doing, doing it when it works out well and the frustration when you can't think of anything to do, and nobody's telling you what to do. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful quote. I think most scientists would say, you know, oh yeah, they've had that moment. What do I do next? I, there's no book I can go to. I have to figure it out on my own. That's what science is all about. And it might seem a little strange that I would advocate frustrating students, but yet I am. I think it is a useful exercise for students to be frustrated on occasion and sort of push through. Now, if they, if they never push through, then they just remain frustrated and they become accountants. But, never <laughs> There are a bunch of roles that teachers can assume when they're working with kids in laboratory. They can be, they can be guides, they can be morale boosters, questioners, suppliers, all kinds of things. I, I love this old picture, by the way, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I found this in, a, in an old textbook. I remember that chart hanging in on the wall of my biology class when I took secondary school biology. It was, it was a very, uh, very bold colors on this chart, and I guess when I was when I, when I was looking at the chart, I was not listening to the, to the teacher, but never mind. I remember that chart. I remember that starfish. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about something I call the arc of science. Some people might call this the scientific method. My students in the back will recognize why I don't like that term. I won't pull forth on that right now. But the arc of science looks something like this. You'll all recognize it. You've got to come up with a problem. You have to plan the method. You have to collect some data. You then negotiate some conclusions. That negotiation could be kind of with yourself or with others. And then finally, you report the results. So call this what you will. I like the nomenclature of the arc of science, this little arc or arch or something like that. Now, the reason I share this with you is not because I don't think you know this. In fact, I'm quite sure that you do. But the reason that I'm sharing this with you is because if you keep this in mind, you can recognize the opportunities for inquiry all over it. Every single spot here, and some that are even kind of implied, can be massaged for inquiry purposes. Do you give the kids the problem? Do you give the kids the method? Do you basically tell them in advance what they're already supposed to know? This is one of the things that makes me crazy about physics instruction, where in fact, in many instances, you have to do an, an error calculation. So you already know the answer, you then calculate in a laboratory setting some number that you already know the answer to, or you know the value of, and then you figure out how close you got to that. I, I'm sorry, I don't know that this happened. I'm sure this wouldn't happen in a high quality place like DCU. But it does seem like a rather strange exercise. You know, you're trying to discover the acceleration due to gravity, but everybody already knows it's 9.8 meters per second squared. And if you don't get something close to that response, when you calculate it on your own, you're going to get lower marks for that. That doesn't sound like inquiry to me. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. So where in this arc of science can you open things up? The, te the literature, by the way, has introduced a really interesting term here. It's called student discretion. When do we give kids the opportunity to mess about on their own? And again, at multiple places within that arc of science, you can, you can do that. The, where does the question come from? What, what, you know, where, what hypothesis is put forward? What about the procedure? Is it, is it lockstep, do this, do this, do this, do this? <clears throat> what should you attend to? What should you record and observe? You know, who makes these decisions? And in some cases, I, I feel very comfortable saying, 
oh, the teacher should point out what it is you should be observing. And sometimes that's the way to go. Sometimes it's not. How to record and report data. It's much easier. I, I was a secondary school biology teacher for a long time, and I will tell you it's a whole lot easier when every lab report looks exactly like all the others. It's a whole lot easier to assess them you know, when they're all in exactly the same order and it, you know, boldface type for the hypothesis, boldface type for the title. It's a, but where's the creativity in that? Now, I understand that there could be some really good reasons why we should have kids write up their lab reports in precisely that fashion. But maybe on occasion, let the students decide how they want to report things on their own. They may be very frustrated by that. They may be very frustrated. What do the data mean? And how are you going to communicate the results? So I've added a few little nuances to that arc of, of science, but all, all of these things are sort of open questions, or perhaps I should say they are questions that could be open. You can lock it all down and tell the students, you can tell them every single one of these things, or you can say, no, that's up to you. That's up to you how you want to report the data. You want to do a histogram, you want to do, you want to do a table, you want to do a graph. I mean, what, you, know, you decide what makes sense to you to report your results. Now, if you haven't seen this before, it will change your life. That's just funny. People say, OK, I'll, I'll pay attention for a moment. I'm going to take everything that I've just said in the last five minutes and put it in a little table. And, and it looks like this. A level zero lab is one where the problem is given, the method is given, and the answers are actually given. I promise you what I'm about to say is a true story, but I sincerely wish I had photocopied this from a lab manual that I saw many years ago. The lab manual said, and I quote, on the line below, write the color of the red liquid. Now, if you have a kid who writes a color other than red, you know it's going to be a really long year. <laughs> That's, that is actually a pretty good example of this, isn't it? You know, just write the color of the red liquid. Okay, I think it's uh, red. Very good, Johnny. Nice job, nice job. Now, if you start to change any of these things and leave this open, you raise the level of the lab. And I talk about raising the, the cognitive bar, the cognitive challenge. It does become more inquiry-oriented. It does become more frustrating must be more frustrating and sometimes more difficult for students, but it becomes much more like real science when you raise the cognitive bar. So here's a number one. Yeah, the problem is given and the ways and means are given, but then the teacher or the book or the lab manual stops and says, okay, it's up to you now. You, you, know, you students, take it from there. So you bright folks in the audience could imagine, you see a pattern developing here. All right, well, let's take out the next one of these chunks and say, right, well, we'll give you the problem, you know, because it's in the syllabus, so we, need, we should stay focused on a particular problem rather than just saying do whatever you like. But we're not going to tell you the ways and means, the method to, to uh, investigate it, and certainly you're going to have to come up with your own answers. So this would be a level two lab, and finally, of course, level three. And I've been very happy in the last couple of weeks to have been out in some schools helping to judge, what's it called, SciFest? Sci yeah, uh, and in the US context, it would be a science fair project, same, same idea, where the students, presumably, have been told, you need to do a project, good luck. <laughs> that sometimes doesn't work all that well to say you need to do a project, good luck, but that is, in a sense, about as close as we come to the doing of real science, real inquiry, in a, in a school setting. And I would argue that science fairs and science quests and science tests and science research competitions, they have lots and lots of different names, are fabulous things as long as they're scaffolding. And what I mean by that is rather than just saying to a kid, oh, in two weeks you have to have your project ready, good luck with that, I would rather say starting in August or September or whenever the school year begins, we're going to do a little hand-holding, sometimes called a gradual release model where you, you model certain things that you want the students to be able to do, and then you get to a point where you can say, okay, you know, you, you're ready to solo. You're ready to go off on your own. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Word for word, this is an actual quote. When I asked an Iowa science teacher, why do you do labs? Why do you do these labs that 
don't have all the instructions provided. Doesn't that cause the kids a lot of hassle? And the teacher said to me, what we're doing in the lab is a guided discovery approach. I've tried it both ways, and there's no doubt that this approach works. That all sounds great, but the next part I love. One way is like pushing a pig up a ramp from behind, and the other is like standing with an ear of corn and saying, come on. Only in rural America would anyone have ever come up with this. And it's very difficult to get clip art, uh, by the way. Very, very difficult to get clip art of a man pushing a pig up a ramp. But my, my buddy Michelle helped me put two images together, removing the hand of the man from the butt of the pig, which was never mind. That's it. it was a really evil looking thing we developed first. Finally, it looked OK. <laughs> All right, now let's talk a little bit about some, some research-based ways to enhance laboratory teaching generally. I mean this sincerely. I'm not expecting that anyone will leave this talk and say, right, I'm going to do all 15 of these things tomorrow. That would be silly. It would also be impossible to radically change every lab that you've been doing and do them with these 15 things in mind. My challenge to you folks would be, could you find one of these 15 things that you're not already doing and try that? And then maybe a second one. And maybe you'll never embrace all 15. That's OK. But I'm going to take the position that changing the way we do labs in one way, two ways, three ways, or all the way up to 15 ways will really, really help um, our kids become better inquirers. There's no expectation that all these things should be done at the same time in the school year. I talked about gradual release, make gradual changes until the students are ready to solo. I like that, that sort of metaphor. And some of these ideas that I'm going to share with you are much more important than others. The research, there's research literature on every one of these. Some of them have a huge amount of, of backup data. And I can point some of those out to you. If I, if I forget, you can ask me and I'll, I'll, you know, there are three or four of these things that are, I think, there must do. I've arranged these. Uh, this is you know, sort of my list. I'm, I'm kind of big on lists because it's easy to remember, I think. Uh, I've put these into chunks, some philosophical issues, some procedural issues, and some pedagogical issues, just to kind of chunk them into these little categories. Um, how, many, how many nature of science things do I advocate? Ooh, I heard nine. <laughs> All right. So some of these are philosophical issues that will relate to some of the things that we've talk, we talked about in, in the module this, this spring. Students should work cooperatively to investigate and negotiate conclusions. By the way, there's no particular order for these. This, this, they're just in these clusters you know, for, for uh, memory purposes. Students should work cooperatively to investigate and negotiate conclusions. Why would I have, why would I make such a recommendation? If we're trying to make this more inquiry-like, and we're trying to make laboratory look as much like real science as we can, isn't this what scientists do? I mean, at, the, in the, at this time in, in the, uh, the world of technology, any, anybody can post anything to the internet. But not anybody can get something published in a peer-reviewed journal. That takes peer review agreement with your conclusions. So this idea that there is a, a, a cooperative nature to knowledge generation in science is, is at the core of this idea. Giving students an opportunity to argue with each other, negotiate, I like, I like that expression. Um, and maybe some student will say, well, I think it's this way. And three others will say, well, no, what's your data for that? What a great conversation that would be to hear in class, that the students are actually saying, well, you can say that, but do you have any evidence of it? This simulates the work, uh, the way that real world scientists do what real world scientists do. Another philosophical issue. It would be great if students would recognize that you can do inquiry at some time other than third period, as I said earlier, or you can do inquiry in a place other than some special room that's called the lab. You don't have to do labs in the lab room. Why not zoos, museums, field sites, and nature centers? <coughs> or any other place you can think of. There's all kinds of interesting opportunity for investigation, sometimes just taking the students out the back door of the school to a, a piece of you know, ground that's out there. Uh, I spent, uh, last week I spent some time with uh, 
a colleague at uh, St. Pat's, we spent two hours doing a kind of a nature study on a, a piece of kind of overgrown property down there at the St. St. Pat's campus. And it was wonderful. There was all kinds of cool stuff growing there, you know, when you take the time to look at it. So students can see that science can occur at places beyond the lab. Some investigations should be long-term, lasting several days or multiple class sessions. It's very difficult to win a Nobel Prize with a 45-minute experiment. Very, very difficult. Sometimes, you know, as you well know, if you looked at the history of science at all, sometimes people will spend, you know, 25 years working on something only to be then recognized for it or criticized for it. Um, but, you know, we chop up school science instruction into these little deliverable chunks, and I understand why we do that. But at the same time, if you were clever, is there anything that could, you know, that you could assign a student to do that might last months? And the answer is yes, of course, or I wouldn't have asked that question. Uh, and when I taught high school biology, in the fall of every year, I told the kids to adopt a tree. I told them to find a tree that they knew that they would see every day. So it was on their, you know, on their property, on their street, at their bus stop, or whatever. They had to find a tree. And they had to make long-term observations of the tree and couple that with some measure of an abiotic factor, which would be like light levels or temperature or weather or something like that. All I wanted them to do was a fairly simple correlation between what they saw happening with a tree over a long period of time and something like the temperature or whatever else they chose to look at. Some students got really into this. I mean, of course, they gave the, the tree a name and it became, had an identity at this point. Other kids, it was a sad, sad year you know, by the, because the assignment was due sometime six months later, and it was amazing how many trees were felled by disease and development and, and you know, errant car accidents and lightning strikes. I'm sorry, mister, I couldn't complete the assignment. My tree is dead. <laughs> it was also, this was a very interesting assignment for a number of other reasons, too, because the students, you know, they, they had to look at the darn tree at least, at least every week or they wouldn't have, they have huge you know, gaps in the data. And that became a very interesting discussion point. Well, you know, you, had, you didn't look at your tree for two months. How do you know what happened during that period of time? You know where it was, you know where it is, but you, know, you, you missed collecting the data during that period of time. It was a great activity. Uh, many of the students, uh, the, the students either loved it or hated it. It was basically the way it played out. <clears throat> so this, of course, is another way of helping students recognize how science is done. We should be teaching authentic and accurate lessons about the nature of science. We need, the, we need to use the lab to model how science works. This one is really problematic because if you haven't had a good grounding in the philosophy of science, it would be hard to know what a lab should look like that models the philosophy of science. So my DCU folks and I spent all, you know, the first half of, the, of this uh, spring term talking about this issue, hopefully getting it right. You know, so when, a, when you talk about a lab, talk about the artificial aspects of it, the school-based aspects of it, and then talk about the aspects that really do resemble how science actually works. Uh, for those folks who didn't have the pleasure of that experience, I'll say just a couple of quick things. We should be emphasizing scientific methods, but not the scientific method. No surprise there to the folks in the back of the rugs. Uh, make the distinction between activities, investigations, and experiments. That's what, This one really bothers me. You know, if you're going to do an activity, call it an activity. If it's an experiment, that's a special kind of activity. But not all experiment, not all activities are experiments. So it, I think it really is useful to, to sort of call it what it is. The primary goal for lab work must be substantiation, not proof, and exploration, not just verification. Uh, we, we tend to say, see, there, the lab turned out the way we expected it, therefore we've proved that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Well, no, it doesn't really work that way. I know it's just a word, but do me a favor. Abandon the word proof from science class. I, I'd love for that to happen. Students should be encouraged to answer personally relevant science questions if they, if they can. Uh, sometimes you know, our agenda is more timely and more important than the student's agenda, but Gosh, just if once or twice a year students could be given an opportunity to, to use the sort of philosophical tools of science to answer a question of their own, that would be fantastic. The best example, of course, would be science fairs, fests, and research competitions. And there is my lovely daughter 
with her award-winning science fair project uh, last year, uh, she and I became, and I, and I certainly did, I, I, was, I was with her on this. I was her lab assistant. Uh, I've noticed here in Dublin there's some little patches of mistletoe in the trees. Well, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's a lot of mistletoe in the trees. These little green bits that stay, they stay green all winter long. They have like little balls up in the trees. And I was, she and I became quite interested in this. Like, well, is it found in every kind of tree? Is it found all over the, t the city? You know, how, how could we find out? I shouldn't have asked that question because then I signed on to drive her hundreds and hundreds of miles all over Fayetteville, Arkansas. And she took a first prize in the ecology section of the local science fair uh, and went on to state where she won third, third place. Uh, so this is a, a fairly standard model for a science fair project in the US, a trifold uh, board. You have to stick to that size. Um, and we took all kinds of pictures, took all kinds of measurements. And probably my daughter knows more about mistletoe in Fayetteville, Arkansas than the local agricultural extension guy. Uh, and that's, that's kind of cool. So I was very, very proud of the work she did. And she would love to be here uh, to, to say goodbye as well, but she's, she's, we're, we're, she's in the city. And she's not packing, even though they have to be on an airplane tomorrow morning, but she's, she's, she needed to say goodbye. She met 4,000 people in Dublin, and she has to say goodbye to each one of them in the vision. <laughs> All right, so lab, uh, now we move on to some procedural issues. Lab activities should come from a wide variety of, of sources. Uh, this may not be a problem, perhaps, or perhaps it should be a problem. It may not be in the Irish context because I know you have these required labs that need to be done in preparation for things like the <coughs> coursework B that I've become both frustrated by and sort of tantalized by. Um, but in the US, there, there are no required labs, that, I, as far as I know, in any state that anybody has to do. So teachers, if they use a laboratory approach at all, would have to come up with the activities on their own. And you know, just simply going to the internet or going to a lab manual could be highly problematic if that lab is, is a bad lab. You know, just rolling it out and doing it is probably not a smart thing to do without really uh, looking at it quite carefully. And labs can come from books and lab manuals, they can come from the web, they can come from colleagues and conferences, and in fact, they should come from all those places, but uh, they need to be worked through. I wanted to say, uh, this is, <laughs> these are the really quick uh, instructions for a fairly common lab that's done in high school biology where you, you learn how to do a test for sugar, you learn how, how to do a test for starch and lipids and proteins. In other words, you, you have a known protein, you have a known starch, you have a known sugar, and you, you, you do the test that will allow you to identify them. But look what it says at the bottom of the screen. Optional, if time permits, you might like to analyze common foods for their nutrient content. In other words, even the people who wrote this lab didn't necessarily expect that the students were going to do anything with the tests that they had just learned how to perform. I don't mind a rather didactic approach to teaching how to do particular science analyses. You know, you, you don't want kids discovering how to use the microscope. They'll break it. You want, you want to teach them how to use the microscope. And so equipment in physics and chemistry is very expensive. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, here's how you take care of this piece of equipment. Here's how you don't. But then not to give the students an opportunity to use it just seems so sad. So even at the very end here, if time permits, you might like to analyze common foods. I would flip this right around. I would say to kids, look, I brought in a whole bunch of foods today, and we're going to learn how to figure out what's in them. What's in bread? Is there any sugar in bread? I don't know. Let's, how would you find out? So it's the same activity, but it starts in a completely different, with a completely different prompt. <clears throat> One of the things that is often that you could do to enhance published activities, you can take out a lot of the step-by-step -step instructions, you can clarify the reading. This one, I, I've actually had uh, science teachers get upset with me when I've suggested this. Change quantitative elements to qualitative ones. You know, why, why is it so important to pour 2.5 mils of liquid in a graduated cylinder? I mean, I understand you don't want the kids pouring 20 mils and you don't want them pouring a half a mil, but in some instances, it, it doesn't matter that much. So kids who have hand-to-eye coordination problems will spend 20 minutes pouring 2.5 mils of blue liquid in the damn graduated cylinder, and half the, you know, half the lab is over. 
And in some cases, you can get very close to the same results. You know, is there sugar in bread or not? Is there fat in bread or not? That's what we're trying to find out. It wasn't a quality. It wasn't a quantitative analysis. It's just simply a qualitative analysis of some of these uh, these foods. Use same terms across all lab activities. If you photocopy a bunch of stuff from 20 different sources, they may use different vocabulary. Improve the included questions. Never write a question like on the line below, note the color of the red liquid. Don't do that. It's not good. Uh, and of course, sometimes you have to modify, lab, modify labs because there are equipment uh, limitations. And of course, it would be wonderful if you could turn the whole lab into a challenge question. And I just did that, in a sense, with this food analysis thing. Here's a piece of bread. What's in it? And, and then the kid would say, well, uh, OK, I, what, what, what do I need to know? You know say, well, here's some tests you can do. More procedural issues. The lab must be developmentally appropriate. If you're familiar with the concept of zone of proximal development, that's a very important concept with laboratory work. Um, would anyone like to share a definition of Z, zone of proximal? ZPD? I always want to say ZPD. ZPD? The zone of proximal development. Next stage, is it? Next stage. Is it the next step they're going to be taking? Is that right? It's, it's the next step that they could move into if you just give them a little bit more push. It's not five steps later. It's one step farther than where they are at the moment. That's a nice way to say it. Be, you don't want to be teaching people things they already know. And you certainly don't want to be teaching things that are you know, five, eight, 10 steps beyond where they are. It's that ripe place where you could just get somebody to, to, to take a little leap. And so the kind of lab that you would do in high school chemistry may not be the kind of lab that you would do in an elementary school. That sort of goes without saying. But uh, sometimes you know, the teacher's more excited about the lab than the, you know, than the kids are capable of doing the lab. And, you know, the results may not be so so promising. This I, I took both these photographs years ago. I, I really love this one. That it was in an elementary school that was a science-based elementary school, and the kids were given three measuring devices, uh, like a, a little a little ruler, um, a, a magnifying glass, and some, one other thing. That, and they were told to go outside and discover something. That was fantastic. You see, all kids, you know, the kids were out there, they were discovering. Now, they, they didn't discover anything scientists didn't already know. I'm pretty sure about that. But what they did discover was stuff that they didn't already know. And that was the beauty of it. <clears throat> Lab investigations should come before significant class discussion of related concepts. This one gets a great big exclamation point. If possible, we should be having kids investigate phenomena before we tell them what they're supposed to see when they investigate phenomena. And in some instances, in many instances, all you need to do is to flip the instruction and the lab around. Because typically what happens is you spend a lot of time lecturing about something, some phenomenon. And then you send the students into the lab to prove it. Oh, OK, what are they going to say? Oh, you know, no, no, I don't think the acceleration due to gravity really is 9.8 meters per second squared. You were wrong in lecture yesterday. Well, no kid's going to say that. So here's, here are the kids taking their notes about the acceleration due to gravity or something. I have no idea. And here's a kid who was given an opportunity to do a little exploration first. By the way, even giving kids an opportunity to mess about with the equipment, if that makes sense to do, before you engage them in a, a sort of formal lecture, can, can orient them toward the, to the direction that you're going to take. So I'm not saying you know we turn this over to the kids and let them do whatever they darn well please. But for instance, I, I can imagine if you were going to talk about basic electric circuits in an elementary setting, what's the harm with providing some wires, some batteries, and bulbs to the young kids and just say, see if you can make the bulb go on. I've done that with elementary kids. And the thing that I love doing is when a kid will say, look, mister, mister, I did it. I made the bulb go light. And then I'll say, see if you can do it another way. That is a fantastic challenge. So where possible, the lab should begin with a challenge question with limited step-by-step -step instructions. And I am going to talk about this little thing in just a minute. I have a better picture of it. Another quote, I always think about how we can structure the lab in such a way that, that asks questions that beg for an answer. 
And here's a great example of that. This is actually from a very old science curriculum project in, in uh, elementary school. And the question is, what color do mealworms like best? So these are mealworms. They're larvae beetles. They're very common, very clean. They, they have a, a, enough of an icky and wow factor that children love these things. And the, you can see here that there, you, you could probably figure out what level this is. The question came from the teacher, right? And this is something that the teacher made up. But after that, it was up to the kids to sort of puzzle it out. You know, do you put the kid, do you put the mealworms on the red and see if they stay there? Do you put them on the blue and see if they stay there? So it's a matter of, you know, what do the kids do with this material, these materials? They got the challenge question, they got the mealworms, and they got this little mat. And they have to then observe, they have to make enough observations that they can say whatever they need to say. I think mealworms like red, or I think they don't care. And every time I move the mealworms into the middle, they just seem to randomly scatter to the four corners. All they really want is to get away from the middle. I mean, there are all kinds of things that kids could discover if, if given time to mess about with this. Ah, but of course, you're probably already thinking, well, you could take that away. You could take this away and say to the kids, here's some mealworms, here's a question. What color do they like best? Go for it. So do you see how that changed, that changed the level of the lab an entire notch just because you took the materials away or you took the, 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 the clear procedure away in this case. It was pretty obvious the kids were going to throw the mealworms on that you know, white thing in the middle and let them go. But I, I was in a, this was a, very, these were very young kids. I spent an entire afternoon observing them, observing mealworms. I had a, I had a great time. I will tell you one quick story. We're probably running out of time because that always happens with me. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a really quick story. I, uh, I was in a kindergarten classroom years ago, and I watched kids doing a button sorting activity. They had this massive collection of buttons. I remember my grandmother had a, a button box that I thought was lots of fun to play with. And so I, I, kind of, I, I, I was kind of into this, watching this one little kid would take a button out, you know, look at the front, look at the back, and put it in a pile. Take another button out. There were hundreds of buttons, and, that, and then there were lots in the piles. There may be five or six piles that the kid had generated, one after another. So. I watched for about 15 minutes. I figured I knew what the rules were. I took a button out. I looked at it, held it back and forth. I put it in pile number two. The kid grabbed it out of pile number two, moved it to pile number five, and gave me a look that could have curdled milk. <laughs> I still don't know what rules the kids would, the kid used, but clearly I didn't have them. Let's take a look at a chemistry, uh, a chemistry challenge lab. I actually watched a teacher do this. This is how the class started. These four equations were on the board, written up, written on the board. And the, and, the, and the chemistry teacher, this was a secondary school chemistry class, the chemistry teacher said, right, you know where all the equipment is. Figure out which one of these reactions is, is accurate. They're all logical. They're all logical. I think they're all balanced as well. And you know, there's nothing, there's no alchemy magic here. There are no elements appearing or disappearing. So, the, the, I watched the students work for two hours to figure out which one of those equations was the valid one. Some kids did it by trying, you know, they, they would take this, what is sodium bicarbonate? Is that, do I have that right? Chemistry folks? Anyway, um, some, uh, some of them tried to heat this and to see what would be driven off. Others um, tried to work backwards, like with process of elimination, they would they would capture some of the gases that were given off and, and figure out, well, that gas can't be hydrogen because it didn't cause a pop when you put the, the burning splint in it. You know, it's, it, was, it was amazing. But the one thing that I want to point out to you is this: I saw this lesson in April. I didn't see this lesson the third day of school. This particular teacher got the kids up to this point. They knew where the equipment was. They knew the safety rules. All he did was walk around the room to make sure kids didn't hurt each other. It was brilliant. It was one of the best lessons I've ever seen in my life, and I've seen a lot of lessons. Uh, I'll just skip through this uh, to save a little bit of time. Oftentimes, the very best activities come from what's at the end of the printed lab, where they'll say something like, you know, if you have more time if, for further investigation, you might want to do such and such. Anyway, so uh, how to find challenge questions, they're often at the end, and they're, they're sometimes just wonderful. 
Um, moving ahead with my list of 15, assessment of laboratory learning should be authentic. There are two definitions of authenticity in, that are used in the educational literature. One of them is that testing should resemble the way in which learning took place. So if kids are learning things in a laboratory setting, then they should be given a challenge question in a laboratory setting to work it out. Uh, that's why I really like coursework B, but I keep hearing from teachers that the dirty little secret seems to be that the teachers actually help the students figure out what coursework B answers are supposed to be. That just seems like cheating to me. I don't quite understand that because the, the premise of coursework B is really very exciting and it's something that I think the country should be you know, modestly proud of and yet if teachers are kind of running or running, doing a little end run as we would say in the states or around the, uh, the actual letting the kids mess about on their own, that's, that's too bad. Anyway, consider the use of practical exams. Students' lab reports should be personally relevant, but again, we talked about why that's a challenge, why it can be a challenge. Assign new related challenge questions. Evaluate lab work with a rubric. That's one of the, I would assume that the people who evaluate coursework B have some kind of a rubric that they work with so that there would be iterator reliability when these little uh, booklets end up uh, at the exam service. And apply continuous evaluation. Um, this, this idea of all eggs in one basket on, at, the, at the end of the course, I, I just, I have a real hard time with that. And I thank you for allowing my module to be continuous evaluation rather than a final exam. And use skills-based checklists. Uh, there's some very famous ones, for instance, the use of the balance, the use of the microscope. You know, you can actually watch kids while they're working. Do, do they show? how to use the microscope properly? Do they show how to use a balance properly? You don't have to give them a, a test per se, you just watch. When they put the microscopes back in the cabinet, do they hold them by the arm and one hand underneath? You know, it's Some of you are saying, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that's right, you gotta hold it by one hand, put your other hand underneath it so you don't drop the darn thing. Uh, anyway. Teachers' verbal behavior should be, in, should be indirect rather than direct. By the way, this little verbal exchange is from that same chemistry teacher. One student says, will it be pretty obvious when it's done burning? Mr. Walker says, I don't know. And another student chimed in immediately, yes, he does. He just wants us to figure, us, figure it out for ourselves. That's brilliant. It's brilliant that the students actually recognized that he wasn't saying, I don't know. I mean, those are the words he used, but what he was saying is, no, 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 you know me better than that. I'm not gonna answer that question. You should be able to answer that question. That's a great little exchange. <clears throat> teachers should engage small groups of students frequently, but briefly. I've observed a lot of teachers working in labs, and sometimes they'll just buddy up to a group of students and talk about something that happened during the weekend. So now, the group, now that group is off task because the teacher got them off task. Kids get themselves off task easily enough. We don't need to do that. Get out of their way. <laughs> Provide support to students working in the lab, but avoid intruding. I like, I, I, do, I, I invented this little term called the butterfly effect, and even before it got used in popular, popular uh, parlance. If a teacher is working with one group of students, and here's something interesting that this group says, the teacher can carry that to another, another group and say, you know, that group over there just found that when you mix these two things, it turns blue, that's kind of neat, and then walk away. In other words, sort of, you know, the bumblebee effect, the butterfly effect, just carry the, good, the goodies from one group to another, but then don't linger. Conduct short pre-lab discussions, but save time for more extensive post-lab debriefings. The, the very best labs are those that get started in five minutes not those that's, that get started in 50 minutes and then you have 10 minutes left to work or something like that. You know, it's, just, it's just a great thing. Um, and, and Kim, that woman in the yellow wrote one of the study guides that Emily uses in her biology class. Yeah. <laughs> I saw this happen last week and I'm gonna tell a tale on Tom McLaughlin who's down at uh, St. Pat's. He was the guy who did the, did the you know, hour and a half long nature study thing. He used his own herbarium sheets with his students. Now, if you're not from, if you're not a bio person, you may not recognize that term, where you've collected some plant specimen and you glue it to a nice piece of white board and you label where it came from. He had about 40 of these herbarium sheets that he made up because that's one of his hobbies. And he shared them with the students. And you could tell that the students thought, oh, he, he actually likes this stuff. This is, 
This is important to him. This is, this is, he's not just teaching this. This is his hobby. I was very impressed by that, and I told him that. I said, you know, I'm giving this talk next week, and I'm, I'm going to talk about you uh, because I saw him do just this. So some conclusions. Involve students in the changes that you make to the normal lab routine, and I'll tell you why, because students get patterned into a mode of behavior where they think they know what it's like to engage in labs. And if you're going to do things differently, they're going to think you don't know what you're doing. So it's very important to sort of come clean and say, yeah, we're going to try something different. Invite discussion and comment, start slowly, make a few changes early in the term, and, and then ramp them up as time goes on. Involve your colleagues, hopefully they'll do the same, so when students get handed off from one grade to another, you don't have to be the odd one out. And celebrate students' successes and pay attention to their reactions. If they're frustrated, dial it back a little bit. But these are some ways to enhance inquiry, so you gotta, you gotta try these things and stick with it. And I would like to say to you and to my various hosts here, uh, this, you know, I, I'm, I'm around for another five, six weeks, so I'm not necessarily saying goodbye. But you know, we're done the term now. I, I had a fantastic time working with the, the students. I thank you, Leanne, for contributing this photo to the uh, to, to my presentation today. So this is it's been great. Everyone who's uh, interacted with me and with my family has been really gracious and really supportive. And we're all very. I know Kim and Emily are very sorry to be leaving tomorrow, and I'm happy that I don't have to. <laughs> Uh, so the McComas family thanks you. Uh, you've met Kim, of course, my daughter, uh, Emily there, taken from the Eiffel Tower. And we had a little father-daughter week in Paris. And she, as she likes to say, Dad will always have Paris. <laughs> uh, and my son you wouldn't have met, but he was here for St. Patrick's Day, uh, arrived early that morning, and slept all afternoon. <laughs> but in any event, thank you all very much. <laughs> Look, it took 55 minutes, right up. <laughs> okay, so we, we've up. My first question is, I counted. There's only 75% of that SE4 class in that group. <laughs> and that's about, on average, how many people <laughs> yeah. showed up every week. Yeah. <laughs> so we have the photographic evidence now, guys. They were all there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I'm sure Bill will take a couple of questions. Yeah, absolutely. And now, by the way, now you know everything that I know about science education. <laughs> I've held back nothing. No, no, I have to, I have to plug Bill's next big engagement for us. We have our oh, yeah, there is more. established <laughs> conference starting on the 7th of June, and, and Bill is doing the opening uh, keynote for that uh, on... Well, well, it's a, I, have we established a title? Yeah, but it's it's basically why we teach science and what you need to know about it. Uh, so it'll be a combination of some philosophy of science stuff with some, some rationales for the teaching of science. I'm just wondering, how do you deal with the frustration of students? If you, because, well, in Ireland, I fail them. So they just fail. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things I think is to is to make sure that you attend to that. You know, rather than just saying to you know thinking, well, that student is probably not as keen as the others, or you know, I mean, it, it's sometimes a very useful thing just to. I, when I orchestrate a laboratory experience, I kind of sidle up to one student. You know, if they're causing trouble, I'll whisper quietly, get back on track. You know, and if they seem to be having trouble, I'll say, say, well, now let's talk about this, and they'll start to, you know, then they'll open up a little bit more. Sometimes the role of the teacher in orchestrating a, a, a lab is just to provide another little chunk toward that zone of proximal development. Just, you know, may, maybe you do have to answer a question directly, unlike Mr. Walker who said, I don't know. Maybe you do have to say, well, now have you thought? But I think attending to the frustration is, you know, I mean, good teachers, good teachers read their audience constantly. You know, you're always trying to figure out. And, and I, you know, when I give a talk even to a professional group like this, you know, when some, when people are nodding, I say, okay, good, I'm, I'm getting, oh, that's good, I resonated on that point. That's what you do. <laughs> yes. Just wondering, have, have you find um, the teachers themselves open to this, or have there been a lot of hostility to them taking the power from them? I find the open teachers to be extremely mm -hmm. open. Uh, <laughs> what I find generally when I talk with teachers is they will say. Um, I don't, yes, yes, Bill, but, and I get that all, I get that in the states, yes, yes, Bill, but we have the final exam, or yes, yes, we have the curriculum, and of course, here you have this 
you know, the, the leaving cert thing seems to be an excuse for everything. I mean, you know, all sorts of deviant behaviors. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, I will, of course, give it a try and say, well, have you, you know, could you, could you recognize that you can get where you want to go two different ways? And you could try this, or you could, you know, you could stick with that. And, and you, I started this conversation by saying, I am a pragmatic guy. I am not just, just you know, a fully idealistic individual. I would never say to any group of teachers, oh, you should be using inquiry 24-7. That would be crazy. I mean, I don't think people would even listen to the message if, if I were to say something like, oh, you know, well, you're not doing that now, you're a terrible teacher. I mean, if we could give students one or two higher level inquiry experiences in a year, we'd be doing one or two things better than the average teacher. I, and I'd be happy with that. Not, not that you need my approval, but, but you should. You should want my approval. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, too, in a sense, that, that happens is oftentimes when I address teacher groups, they're, it's, it's a, they're volunteers like you folks. Nobody, I don't think, made you come today. You know, so oftentimes people I talk with are a little more ready and interested and willing to hear you know, a little bit of out-of-the-box recommendation than, than a, a, you know, a group of, an, in, an in-service thing where teachers have to sit there and, I remember doing one in the school once where all the, you know, all the teachers had to come to this talk and there was a guy in the back, I was talking about the philosophy of science and I, I said, well, you know, there really is no scientific American, uh, no scientific, there is no scientific method of, you know, of a five-step, seven-step method and some guy in the back rows was really angry with me. So I've been teaching that for years. Yes, well, I can't help that, sir. But <laughs> you've been wrong for years. <laughs> no, he was he was really angry. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Sorry, I think the comment I was going to make all right, you seem to hit on it there. There can be a fine line indeed, Kappa, between trying to get to a prior base level with students that come into a lab and trying to ensure at the same time that they have enough knowledge to proceed. So Ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why I very deliberately pointed out that that, that problem-solving activity that the chemistry teacher did was not the first week of school. The first week of school in his class, they wouldn't have known where the supplies were. They wouldn't have known the safety lessons. That He ramped up to that. He took months to get the students ready. Uh, and the day I happened to observe, I mean, it, it was just, I felt so lucky. You know, I walked in and he said, right, there, there it is, there are these equations, tell me which one's correct. And in, in many U.S. schools, they have a double lab period, so there would be, say, a 90-minute period uh, where you could, you know, you have, a, you have time to do that sort of thing. But, the, but you're exactly right. If the students aren't ready for it, I mean, that could have been a disaster if every student said, uh, I have absolutely no idea what to do, sir. <laughs> you know, what, what, do you, what do you do with that? But it was very clear that he knew that they were ready to do that. That that's a very higher, you know, high level activity. What's the answer? <laughs> I could go back and look, but what, so we, <laughs> we'll, we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> but if I look at that in, in, in DCU, like the, the first year chemistry labs and the first year physics labs, and the way they kind of have been changed around and, and the focus has, I, I would say, at least targeted some of these fifteen things and not achieved some of these fifteen things. But it's not one teacher with 80 students. It's it's the actual, and again, the SC4 is probably would testament to this. The, the lab, the demonstrators, the tutors of the different labs, you'd go, oh, what that tutor, not this one. Yeah. <laughs> Some yeah. facility for another. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it, it's okay as a teacher if you're doing facilitation yourself, but, but it's training mm -hmm. the tutors, or enabling the tutors yeah. to, to, be, to be effective. And, and, uh, yeah, and I, I think that's a challenge that, yeah, and how you model that, I think, in I think Paul and Pat will be kind of the main... I think teachers have a logical desire that the students, you know, achieve. And so some people will reject inquiry because they're just worried that the students will, you know, will fall behind. They won't, they won't get there. Some teachers also like a level of control that inquiry doesn't really permit. I mean, I will tell you, in that chemistry class, there was a lot of talk. The kids were chatting with each other, and they were, you know, swapping ideas, you know, from one end of the room to the other. And 
But it was all on task behavior. If you had listened to what those students were talking about, it was all very relevant, important talk. And of course, if anyone's ever been to a scientific meeting, there's a lot of talk in scientific meetings. And some of it gets to be kind of heated. And that's simulating that is a, is a good thing. But you have to be uh, willing to embrace some disorder as the teacher. I mean, if you want kids in rows, you know, just dutifully taking notes, teach history. No, I don't. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this. What's, the, what's one thing of the 15 that you, that you either disagreed with or found compelling enough to, to try something? One of the 15 things that you, you said, yeah, that was kind of interesting. I don't think it'll work. Or yeah, that was kind of interesting, but, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that. Can I just randomly call on somebody? How about you? Well, I'm not sure that <laughs> so I said nothing of interest. <laughs> not at all. Very interesting. I'm a random staff member here in DC. Well, how come you're not at your desk? I don't do this at all. So <laughs> not for I mean, it's like an education institution and research. Yeah, I find it very interesting. I remember for, I do chemistry for the leading search. Uh -huh. And um, I do remember a lot of chalk and talk. I yeah. would really have loved to have gotten out the equipment a lot more. And, use the science. So starting out with, yeah, challenge question, kind of going, figure that out. Because that, for me, and I know I did it sort of over 10 years ago, I never started off like that. Yeah. So there was something. Thank you. Yeah, Very good. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, idea, yeah. the idea of the challenge question. And then I can figure it out. I can actually, I'm, I'm clever enough to figure it out. I have you seem clever. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that I, can, that I can do it. Yeah, it's not so scary. Yeah. yeah. And especially when you've been, you know, when, you, when you've had success, you know, maybe the first time somebody gives you a challenge question, you don't know what to do, and that is a bit frustrating, but by the third or fifth time, see, and I will tell you again, I keep coming back to that one chemistry class, I didn't sense that the students were bothered by that. They, they seemed, you know, it wasn't as if they all said, oh, right, I know exactly what to do. But they were okay with their level of the unknown, of, of the unknown and, uh, and whatever modest frustration was in, you know, was resonant in the room. They were okay. It, I, I will tell you that I mean, it was fun to watch the students at work because they had to take the the uh, the reactant, sodium bicarbonate, right? I think, and they had to heat it. I, I should have in indicated that. That was the deal. They had to heat it and then figure out what the what the products were. And one group used all of their reactant immediately. You know, their, their first trial was their own trial, and they realized. Oops. So they went to the teacher. This is where the teacher, you know, is, can be a material supplier. And they said, uh, we used all our stuff. And the guy said, he goes, that wasn't very smart, was it? You know, and, and they all said, no, it wasn't. You know, and that was a great exchange. You know, and he didn't have to say, well, that was, you know, he didn't go into a big, long lecture about it. It was simply a matter of, okay, obviously, if we're going to have multiple trials and I only have a certain amount of the reactant, I need to, you know, parse it out into five little piles then instead of using it all at once. So he gave them more and that was the end of that. It was fun. Right. Was there anything of the 15 that you, that just sounded like couldn't possibly work? Oh, I like that too. <laughs> a lot of good ideas there and again with the maps, we would try and run a number of them individually so each student is improving on the lab skills. Yeah. Yeah. Individual. But I'd like to take you have it on there whereby it could be possible to incorporate one report, one set of, one result of such from two students. Oh, sure. So it would really engage that communication. Yep. So they can do their work on their own, per se, have their own results, but don't feel compelled that they have to write it up on their own. Yeah. They can come together and discuss it and just submit the one answer. Yes. So I can like that idea that it allows the communication of the mm -hmm. They can thrash out the results together. Yeah. And then, of course, another thing that, that could happen, again, to simulate the way science really works is, I mean, you, you could, even as the instructor, you could randomly choose five students who have now completed the same activity and, and put them together as a group after the fact. They didn't work together at the time, but then they have to come together to negotiate conclusions after the data collection is over. And then, you know, you're starting to compare columns of, oh, how come your numbers don't look like mine? But are they close enough that we could say that we should average them, for instance? Or are there some data points that are such outliers that they would, you know, we, we could justify not counting them? I think that, that that could be kind of an interesting idea, forming lab groups after the lab is completed. But it, 
one of the things I talk with, with my own students at home about all the time is, is teachers need to have reasons for doing what they're doing. Whatever they're doing, I, I'm, I'm on board. I, you know, very rarely do I see a teacher doing something that I think is just wrong. But many, many, many times I see teachers doing things for which they don't have a rationale. You know, and I think that's, I think at every level of teaching, whether it's, whether it's in higher education or, or whether it's in, in primary or secondary education, you know, it's, time is valuable. And you should have a reason for doing what you're doing. And if you can't articulate a reason, then maybe you shouldn't be doing it. And talks like this, I think, provide, I hope, provide a little bit of ammunition for why you might do some things differently than you, than you might have otherwise. So I thank you again for your attention. OK, well, I'm going to bring it to a close because there is refreshments outside. And, Good. Uh, and Bill is available for much more conversation outside yeah. on a one-to-one -one basis. So I'll ask you to, to thank Bill for his talk. Thank you for your time here. Especially thanks to Kim and Emily leaving tomorrow. And good luck for getting that flight. And, uh, Emily's not packed yet. I have absolutely <laughs> no idea how she's getting on a plane at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you very much, Bill. Thank you.